Vision, those were incredibly kind words, and I can't thank you enough for that. And getting to that point where we were able to build something was a long and arduous journey that I think a lot of people are going to be able to relate to because it started from a place of absolute terror. And growing up, I didn't show any early signs of uh, promise. A little embarrassing to put these photos up. I wish these photos were atypical, but in reality, that is what I look like pretty much all the time. Uh, I always had some sort of clown hat on. I actually wore my pajamas out and about on the streets. That's San Francisco. Um, yeah, that was really where I started. And wanting to do something with my life, I had this unending ease that I could do more, I could be more. I just didn't know how, and I felt trapped, but I didn't know what I was trapped by. And my own mother, who's always been my biggest cheerleader, who all but kicked me out of the house when I was panicking and didn't want to leave the state for college, was actually the only person in my graduating class to leave the state. Uh, wasn't something that people from Tacoma, Washington did. You stayed, you went to a state school. My mom still lives less than three miles from the house that she grew up in. So this is not a place where people go off and explore. But my mom always felt like if I didn't do that, that I would have a lot of the same regrets that she had, that I wouldn't see the world, that I wouldn't discover myself, and that one day I would look back and say, what if I had only tried? Now, what she didn't tell me at the time, but she has since confessed, is that she just assumed I was going to fail. <laughs> Now, my mom is hilarious. She's not Jewish, but you would think she is, because her whole life, since kicking me out of the nest, she's been desperately trying to claw me back. <laughs> And so one day I finally asked, I said, what is with that? Like, literally, you forced me to leave and go to college, so why have you worked so hard to get me back? And that's when she said, with nothing but love in her heart, I just always thought you would fail. <laughs> and that was a gift. It was really a gift, because at that moment I realized that the things that I've accomplished in my life had nothing to do with being given something at birth. Now, I felt this unease that I was talking about, that I could do more, but I was stuck, and I didn't know what I was trapped in. In 1999, a movie came out called The Matrix. That movie ended up giving me the intellectual framework to think about what was happening in my life, because there was something limiting me. There was something that made me feel adrift. And this gave me the vernacular to think about what it was. And in the movie, they talk about taking the red pill. The red pill, its only promise Its only promise is the truth. That's it. It's not saying that it's going to make things better. It's simply going to reveal the way that the world really is. And that, for me, was incredibly intoxicating. And I took the red pill intellectually. And what I began to realize is that the mind is the matrix in and of itself. Now, there's people that will debate whether we actually live inside the matrix, whether we're actually in a simulation, and it's a fun conversation, but I honestly don't care about the answer because I can tell you right now, today, in this moment, I promise you, the matrix has you. If you guys know David Foster Wallace's concept of this is water, to a fish, water is so ubiquitous it ceases to exist. Now, we all have that same thing, and it's playing on us, and it's keeping us from becoming who we want to become. And that thing is our mindset. It's our belief system. It is so ever-present. It is so ingrained into the fabric of who you are and the way that you process data, you don't even notice it. You don't even know that it's real. And this is the thing that impacts your life. It is your inability to see that your mindset controls everything, that it is water in and of itself. Now, when I heard this from Shakespeare, I realized that once you become aware of the water, you can change everything that you can go from a scared, lost kid in Tacoma to whomever you want to be. And in understanding that, things began to become possible. There's nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. And if that's true, then belief itself is a construct. And if belief is a construct, belief, if belief is a construct, then like any other construct, it can be manipulated and changed. And at any moment, this is so important, at any moment, you can choose to believe something new about yourself. Now, the weird thing about belief is as soon as you change that belief, it becomes true. Why that is, I will never quite understand. What weird quirk of human evolution has left us in a space where simply believing it makes it true? If you think you're dumb, guess what? You're dumb. 
truly, and you will act in accordance with that belief, and that should scare the shit out of you because it scared the life out of me, and I saw myself heading down a path that I did not want to be on because I believed that I was dumb. I had a fixed mindset. I used to only apply for jobs where I knew I'd be smarter than the person interviewing me because I did not want to feel badly about myself, but you can imagine the types of jobs that I got. I once lovingly referred to myself as the king of remedial jobs. And I actually had pride in that because what I built my sense of pride around was getting the job, was always being smart, was being right, and none of those things were moving me towards my goals. Now, if you don't know this quote, live by it. One can have no smaller or greater mastery than mastery over oneself. That's Da Vinci. Da Vinci did amazing things with his life. I wanted to do equally amazing things with mine. And if that's the game that we're playing, if I can construct my belief system, if I can choose at any moment to believe something that's more empowering than I was believing the moment before, and that that will actually find its way into my actions, allow me to do things that I couldn't do the moment before, then it's like that moment in The Matrix where Neo realizes he knows Kung Fu. And that's like, as funny as that is, that's how I think about life. To me, the very fundamental purpose of life is to find out how many skills I can acquire that have utility and then put that utility to the test in service of something greater than myself. How many skills can I acquire that have utility, put that utility to the test in service of something greater than myself? That is, for me, the purpose of life. Now, I don't actually want to know Kung Fu. That is not the mission that I'm here to live. But I knew that I had to identify my mission. So what was going to be my mission? Mother Teresa has an amazing quote. Nobody will act for the many, but people will act for the one. And that really struck me because I realized they were right. I was looking at this global pandemic of ill health, and I wasn't moving into action. But thinking about my mom and my sister, or the uncle I had who ate himself to death when I was 12 years old, that made me want to act. Now, at the time I began thinking about what my mission was, my partners and I were running a technology company. That technology company was not mission-based. It was designed to make a lot of money. And we were making money, and we were winning awards, and we were standing in this beautiful conference room overlooking the Pacific Ocean, and I turned to them and I said, I'm completely miserable. And there I was, living the cliche of money can't buy happiness, which is pretty ironic, because I'm a guy that actually understands the power of money. Money is the great facilitator. Money can make things happen. It's powerful. It has true utility. So how then? as it's going through my fingers, am I not able to find fulfillment? And the reason is that fulfillment exists outside of all of that. Fulfillment has to do with the last part of what I believe the purpose of life is, and that is to exist doing something in service of something greater than yourself. And if you're not able to tap into that, then you're never going to get that fulfillment that you want in your life. This is the central tenet by which I believe everyone should live. You can create yourself. In fact, no one else is going to create you. But if you forget that you're in water, if you forget that the matrix has you, if you don't realize that everything you believe is a choice, everything you believe is a choice, if you forget any of that stuff, then you will not be able to make yourself in the person that you want to be. Man cannot remake himself without suffering, for he is both the marble and the sculptor. That is, it gives me the chills even now to think about that, to know that if I want to become the person that I want to become, I am going to pay a price. And to me, the question that we all have to ask is, who do I want to be? What do I want to become? And how high of a price am I willing to pay to get there? And I will pose to you that the people that you most admire, the people that have achieved at a level that you want to achieve, they are no different than you. They simply know what they want to become, and they're paying the price to get there. That's it. Right now, between me and the person I want to be, between you and the person you want to be, there is a gap of skill set, and that's it. But once you know your mission, and once you believe 
that you can accomplish anything you set your mind to, then you can do the extraordinary. Now, for me, getting out of that space of being lost, of not knowing what I wanted to do with my life, it all came down to needing to earn credibility with myself in very small incremental ways. This is me 60 pounds ago. And I knew if I was going to accomplish anything in my life, I was going to have to get control of my mind. Now, ironically, there's two ways to get control of your mind. Way number one is directly going to the mind, which can be very scary, can be very daunting, very ethereal. It's ephemeral. It's hard to grab onto. It's hard to touch. But way number two is through the body. And so I decided that my kung fu was going to be to get very good at developing my body. And in that process, I was going to learn about nutrition, which would allow me to help my mom and my sister. In that process, I was going to earn credibility with myself. And earning credibility with yourself is so important. Do it in micro ways. For me, just showing up to the gym every day was a micro victory. I said I was going to do it, and I did it. Now, you have to understand, I hate working out. So for all of you crazy people that get an endorphin rush from running, I hate you all. <laughs> running for me is like being stuffed into a meat grinder. There is absolutely nothing pleasurable about it whatsoever. So whatever neurological thing you guys get that you've been blessed with, I have not been blessed with that. So for me, showing up at the gym sucks. Eating a bowl of ice cream is awesome. And so getting to, getting to a better place for me was a totally different journey. Thank you. And what that was, it was just showing up every day and putting in the work. It was reading about human metabolism and understanding how what I eat impacts my body. It was earning a little bit of discipline every day, knowing that, well, I did it yesterday. I can do it again today. It was not eating something that I wanted to eat. And most importantly, and if you're taking notes, write this down. It was about changing my identity. Because at the end of the day, identity and values drive behavior. Amen. Preach. <laughs> identity and values drive behavior. So if you want to make a change, you have to change your vision of who you are. You have to begin telling yourself a different narrative. And the narrative you tell yourself about yourself is everything. And if you tell yourself that you're a scared, undereducated kid from Tacoma whose family has never accomplished anything, let me tell you what you will become. A scared, undereducated kid from Tacoma who never accomplishes anything, because that's what you believe. You tell yourself that story enough, and it will become real. But on the flip side, you could tell yourself a story of you're a learner. You learn faster than most people. You're willing to put in more work than most people. You're willing to read more books than most people. You're willing to spend an inhuman amount of time every day improving your mind simply by getting new ideas into the system and that you will admit that you're wrong faster than anybody else, that you won't let your ego get in the way and you tell yourself that story over and over and over so when somebody comes and tells you how stupid you are, that you're just a dumb kid from Tacoma, you go, you're right, that's amazing. Thank you for pointing out that flaw because now that I'm I'm aware of it, I can improve it because I'm the learner. And once I switched my narrative to being the learner, it didn't matter where I started, it only mattered where I was trying to go. And as long as I had that clarity, then I could execute because I believed I could do anything I set my mind to without limitation. All right, there are very concrete habits that you can use, that I have used. Once you get your mind in the right place, once you believe that it can happen, this is what I did. I worked out. Why? Because it helped me gain control of my mind. One, it was micro-credibility with myself every day. I said I was going to do something. I did it. Two, when you're suffering and you're willing to fight through it, you tell yourself a story that you're willing to pay the price to become what you want to become. And also, and this may be the most important reason each and every one of you should start working out, and it has nothing to do with living longer, because we could get hit by a meteorite. Who knows? So I'm not even worried about that. But I am worried about this. When you watch your body transform, you get the loudest signal from your subconscious that you can change, that you can change anything you want, that you can change your bicep, your tricep, your quad, whatever it is that you want. Something that you literally could not do the day before, you can do today. And your mind sees that that's true. Your mind sees that something you couldn't pick up yesterday, you can pick up today. 
And it begins to ask itself, well, if that's possible, then what else is possible? Now, for me, finding my center was also a very important thing. So I work out first. The next thing I do without fail is meditate. I do a just breathe meditation where I'm simply trying to calm my mind. Then I do what I call thinkitating. During meditating, I get into an alpha wave state brain pattern, which enhances creativity and unique connections. I'm not worried about whether I'll ever think a unique thought. I am simply interested in the unique connections that I will make that no one else before me or after me will ever make because their circumstances are different than mine. And that to me is what makes each of us a beautiful snowflake is we're all gonna make connections that other people might not make. And so during thinkitating, I take advantage of a problem I'm trying to solve, I smash it together with my alpha wave state and I see what comes out of it. I read, I read obsessively because I believe in one simple math equation, ideas in equal ideas out. And then I keep a list of the most important things I'm trying to accomplish. If you're trying to become something, you need to know what that something is. And then this is the most important piece, I execute. Only execution matters. Burn that into your nervous system. Get a tattoo. Do whatever you need to do to remind yourself. Only execution matters. Thinking about it, feeling good about it, those are awesome. But if you have a vision of something you're trying to do, become whatever, and you don't execute against it, and I don't need you to want to build a big business. If you tell me you want to be the greatest parent of all time, then I'm going to ask you, what are you doing to execute on that goal? What are you doing? How do you define it? What are your deliverables? What are the metrics by which you're judging yourself? And by the way, if you don't want a grand goal, you don't need one. But then say, what I'm trying to do is get centered. I'm trying to experience happiness. Even that, you can begin to look at ways that you can improve that. Now, I very much subscribe to the theory that the human animal is an active species, meaning it will forever be moving forward. I think that's a good thing. It's one of the most exciting things in my life. And I have three fears. One, brain damage. That freaks me out. Two, losing my wife because, damn, that woman's cool. And then three, I don't ever want to feel like I've hit the end of what I can do. I always want to feel like there's something more that I can learn and grow into. So keeping in mind... Execution is how you get there, no matter what your path is. All right, it always starts with having very, very clear goals. From there, this is the secret sauce to executing. This is the thing that you need to do with your mind. There's an entire talk that I give on this one slide alone, so I'm gonna go fast. We've already talked about um, values and identity drive behavior. Ego is a must. And I know when we talk about meditating, we talk about transcending the ego, and maybe it's possible, and maybe I just haven't been able to do it. But let me tell you how I've leveraged the ego that I have. I believe people commit suicide when they no longer believe that they will ever feel good about themselves again. Now here's the scary part. I think that's a reasonable reaction. The only problem is it's a lie. And if you know the Buddhist teaching, there's an amazing phrase, this too shall pass. Whatever you're feeling, whether you're feeling great or whether you're feeling terribly, it's going to pass. But if truly you could never feel good about yourself ever again, why would you want to go on? Even serving other people, you do it in part because of how beautiful it feels. So helping people understand that that will pass, that there will be something beautiful again waiting for them, but that what you build your self-esteem around, what that ego is tied to is absolutely critical because if you tie it to being right, if you tie it to being good, if you tie it to being pious, if you tie it to anything that is fragile or tenuous, it can go away and then your ego is damaged and then the psychological immune system kicks in and then you start making really weird choices. So build your ego around something positive. Build your ego around something that is truly anti-fragile. Something that's anti-fragile is not something that's resilient. Resilient things are still defined by their breaking point. Their breaking point just happens to be far away. Anti-fragile is the more it's attacked, the stronger it gets. I used to pride myself on being right. I used to pride myself on being smart. Bad news is I'm really not that bright and I was wrong all the time. Really. And the thing, Lisa Nichols, are you here? Oh, God, that woman's in this place somewhere. She gave me some of the most powerful words I have ever heard, and they have stuck with me. You do not get to make me extraordinary as an excuse not to succeed. When she said that, I was like, I really wanted to, though, Lisa. You're special. There's something you have that I don't. 
And when she said that, I thought that's so true. Whenever you look at somebody that's been successful, do not allow yourself to make them extraordinary at your expense. You're capable of whatever it is that they're capable of. But it comes down to the mental constructs that you're going to have to build and leverage in your own mind in order to do something great. So I switched my self-esteem from being right and being smart to being the learner who was always willing to admit that he was wrong, identify the right answer, give credit to the person who thought of it, and put more energy behind it than anyone else. And that became my driver. Now, what did I do with that driver? I turned that change in attitude, along with my co-founders at Quest Nutrition, into building, as Vision said, the second fastest growing company in North America, valued at over a billion dollars, every financial dream I'd ever had in my life come true. But at the end of the day, the only thing that mattered had nothing to do with the money. And it had everything to do with, we set out to build a business around value creation. We set out to actively ask one question. What would we do and love every day, even if we were failing? And that, for three very different reasons, ended up being attacking the pandemic of the body, trying to help people live a more beautiful life. And there were times where putting that value first meant that we did things that were less profitable. There were times where we put that value first and it was outright stressful to the company, but that was the driver. And that was the thing that actually allowed us to grow because people could feel that this company was different. They could feel that we weren't after the sale. They could feel what we wanted was to help. And in today's world, leading with that, as you guys know, if you're at this conference, can have tremendous rewards. The original title of my speech was Helping the World is Big Business, or Saving the World, I think. Saving the World is Big Business. But after meeting you guys, I realized we needed to talk about something completely differently. Because you guys know more than most, it's not about the money. So what is it about? It has nothing to do with who you are today. Don't worry about that. I'm not very interested in the person that I am today. I am a far cry from the person that I can imagine and the person that I promised myself that I will continue to work to become. So it's not about who you are. It's about who you want to become and the price you're willing to pay to get there. Become that person. Change the world. Change yourselves. Do beautiful shit. Thank you, guys. Oh,